Thank you so much. I, um, I sort of tend to be somewhat on um, Graber's side in terms of uh, not describing social and pers personal obligations in the language of debt. So I'll just say that I'm um, deeply grateful to, um, to Peter and to Emmanuel um, for inviting me and also for the staff, um, Trauda and the rest of the staff who were so helpful in organizing this. Thank you so much. Um, I also begin with an apology, which is that um, this, is, this talk is not exactly on debt um, in a very direct way. Um, and it's also not uh, at all about culture per se. Um, I'm feeling some amount of regret about that now. Um, but uh, as, this is sort of a part of a side project um, um, that I got interested in a couple of years ago on stagnation and stagnation theory. And I'll sort of explain what that is. So I think it has relevance, but the relevance may be um, tangential. A specter is haunting mainstream economics, the specter of economic stagnation. In 2013, the American economist and former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Sever Summers gave a speech at the IMF in which he began by congratulating his colleagues on their, quote, great achievement of resolving the financial crisis of 2008. And yet, in the four years since the end of the recession, he went on to observe, neither unemployment nor GDP had improved. There's something odd, he mused, about this continued slow growth. In light of this, he went on to argue, perhaps, quote, a set of older ideas that went under the phrase secular stagnation, ideas which he re acknowledged had been, quote, firmly rejected in his own economics courses at MIT, were relevant again. Despite Summers' relatively phlegmatic tone of curiosity about this something odd, his prediction caused economists and observers to pretty much freak out. The Economist, Wall Street Journal, and Time all covered secular stagnation, while Ben Bernanke debated it with Summers, and Paul Krugman grumped that he had been saying the same thing for a long time. In 2015 alone, um, I should also say that actually these headlines, um, at least two or three of these headlines are from the last year and a half, so this debate has continued well past 2013. Uh, in 2000, uh, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, in 2015 alone, three major works of economic theory agreed with Summers. Robert Gordon's The Rise and Fall of American Growth argued that the U.S. economy was in a period of permanent stasis. Finance expert Satyat Das claimed that, quote, the central illusion of the age of capital, endless economic growth, is ending. And economist Mohammed El Aryan rejected his own 2009 prediction of restored growth and forecasted instead total global stagnation. Summers himself has not only continued to make the argument, but in fact made it even more forcefully in the six years since. In this talk, then, I want to consider a few of the all too few moments in bourgeois economic thought when the conventional belief in capitalism's limitless growth faltered. I want to note that both prior to and alongside neoclassical and developmentalist theories of perpetual improvement and expansion, there are alternative predictions of economic innervation and decline. Indeed, I want to suggest that rather than reading these grimmer predictions as marginal cases or superseded moments of heterodoxy, we might even read them as a crucial, if hidden, undercurrent in the history of economic thought. Stagnation theory, I will suggest, illuminates the tension between the two accounts of crisis bequeathed to us by, bequeathed by Marx to the heterodox tradition. One of cyclical crisis, which regularly, quote, tosses up big storms on the world market, but eventually resolves itself. The other of terminal crisis, the long-term tendency of capital to exhaust and expel the very resources it requires. These two offer foundationally distinct dramatizations, the temporary blowout on the one hand, the permanent impasse on the other. This distinction, is the crisis punctual or permanent, accounts for no small amount of contradictory appearance within bourgeois economics, and also in the more radical forms of thought that likewise try to apprehend the present conjuncture. Mainstream secular stagnation theory resolves this paradox by imagining a kind of zombie capitalism, a slow or no growth economy that somehow neither falls nor is replaced, but simply continues limping forward in perpetuity. A capitalism whose slow innervation might not end in violence, an argument that seems frankly less and less persuasive today. 
Yet I want to suggest that the figure of stagnation might also offer us some insight into the experience of the present, the experience, that is, of a capitalism gone spongy, saturated with too much capacity and too many goods and too many unemployed, with no ability to move and nowhere to go, but still persistently, sluggishly slouching towards some far-off Bethlehem, going out more whimper than bang. The practice of ruthless critique has long been associated with the liquefaction or the unfixing of what is rigid or reified. All that is solid melts into air. Yet capitalism in stagnation seems to require us to re-solidify, to think in terms of stall, immobility, stasis. In this talk, then, I offer a very abbreviated intellectual history of stagnation theory, attending in particular to its naturalization of economic limit. I then take up the two sides of stagnation theory's demographic coin, its anxiety about birth rates, one that goes all the way back to Malthus, and its much more recent concern about mortality and morbidity. The barren, exhausted, overworked body, I suggest, functions in stagnation theory both as empirical cause, because the theory names underpopulation as the origin of economic slowdown, and as rhetorical figure. In the end of this talk, I turn to a different figure of reproductive exhaustion to think about the language and the politics of generational immobility. So where did this older idea Summers evokes come from? It comes most directly from Alvin Hansen, a student of Keynes who first used the phrase secular stagnation in a 1938 address entitled Economic Progress and Declining Population Growth. For Hansen then, secular stagnation, and I should mention here that secular, this is maybe obvious, but people have asked, so I'll explain it. Secular here means the opposite of cyclical, not the opposite of theological. Um, so for Hansen then, secular stagnation described a condition of low growth that was more than just a business cycle downturn, but was instead an intractable, long-lasting feature of the global economy, which he believed tended inevitably towards permanent low growth and high unemployment. Hansen was also bearish on the degree to which fiscal policy alone could drive a slowing economy ever forward, and, like Summers after him, believed that the power of technological innovation to drive economic profitability was both naturally limited and historically waning. And in a way, this, his, um, this thesis about technological growth is kind of the most interesting and most persuasive thing about his argument. I don't talk about it much today, but it, it is interesting and we could talk about it in the Q&A. Of course, this idea of slowdown wasn't new to 1939 either. The prediction that economies inevitably tended to fall into stasis, or at least were always in danger of doing so, was quite common to much of 18th and early 19th century classical political economy. We are most likely familiar with the ideas articulated by Thomas Malthus, whose dismal science held that economic history tended toward decline. But Adam Smith, J.S. Mill, and others also saw the low growth, quote, stationary state, that's the term that's used most frequently in the 18th and 19th century, as the inevitable end point of economic development. For Smith, the economy was both national and natural, and the national container could only hold so much. Once the nation was, quote, fully stocked with natural resources and, quote, fully peopled with workers, its economy could grow no further. Yet classical political economy's theory of economic finitude was itself not long for this world, done in by the pyrotechnic growth of the world economy that happened in the latter half of the 19th century. Sometimes I think like I could just give an entire talk just about this one slide. <laughs> Smith's and Malthus's belief that economic growth was limited because land was limited made sense in the organic economy of the pre-industrial period in which productive capacity depended on how much energy one could command, but less sense in the wake of the massive expansion of technological productivity of the early 19th century. So basically this theory of economic finitude as a sort of natural state gets undone by what happens with the Industrial Revolution, both in terms of the exponential growth um, of profitability, but also just because of the way that a certain understanding of the machines and of energy sort of transforms people's understanding of what is natural in the first place. In the wake of the Great Depression, however, Hansen could develop a very different perspective on the inevitability of capitalist progress and have much less faith in the exponentially transformative energy of capitalism. 
The opening of his 1939 essay thus makes obvious the connection between a certain account of constantly advancing, constantly changing capitalist expansion and a certain account of historical consciousness as such. Throughout the modern era, Hansen writes, ceaseless change has been the law of economic life. Every period is in some sense a period of transition. The swift stream of events in the last century offers, however, overwhelming testimony in support of the thesis that the economic order of the Western world is undergoing in this generation a profound structural change. We are passing, so to speak, over a divide which separates the great era of growth and expansion of the 19th century from an era which no man, unwilling to embark on pure conjecture, can as yet characterize with clarity or precision. We are moving swiftly out of the order in which those of our generation were brought up into no one knows what. In the wake of the various revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries, Marx and Engels could discern, quote, constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation. For Hansen, by contrast, the profound and as yet unreckoned structural change that defines his present is the end of the kinds of change that defined the past. What threatens capitalism, he suggests, is not explosion or disintegration, but stagnant growthlessness and non-development. Or, as Summers later put it, revising Keynes, if you die in the short run, there is no long run. Mainstream economists, especially mainstream economists who currently work as consultants for hedge funds, like Summers, are not exactly where we might think to turn for a ruthless critique of present conditions. Yet it is nonetheless remarkable that mainstream economists are talking about economic slowdown in the first place. As a friend of mine once said, during times of economic crisis, people turn to Marx like they turn to gold. Likewise, the mainstreaming of ideas once pretty firmly rejected, to use Summers' drastically understated phrasing, suggests that a specter haunts not just the economy, but economics as well. Theories of secular stagnation rebut basic axioms of neoclassical thought, including Say's law and Walrossian general equilibrium theory, both of which assert that supply always creates a demand adequate to exhaust it. For Smith, Hansen, and Summers, by contrast, during periods of stagnation, lack of demand creates lack of supply. Thus, the eventual equilibrium reached when the economy's supply potential decreases is a stagnant economy with what Hansen calls, quote, weak and anemic growth. We ought to pause, however, on that language of the anemic. Stagnation theory has long tended to deploy figures of nature and especially of the body. Although Hansen's argument is addressed to 20th century Keynesianism, his language, specifically these images of flood and blood, situates him within what Catherine Gallagher has termed the bioeconomics of 18th century classical political economy. Images of natural liquidity pervade classical political economy, as in Smith's idea that nations can be, quote, filled to the brim with natural resources, or J.S. Mill's description of the no-growth economy as the, quote, stagnant sea at which all economic journeys end. Inspired by new anatomical science like William Harvey's, oops, sorry, there's that one. Um, so here you see the way that he's using um, the language of um, tides and accretion and, and floods. Uh, in, Inspired by new anatomical science like William Harvey's mid-17th century treatise on the motion of the heart and blood, classical political economy also uses metaphors of liquidity to represent money as the vital lifeblood of the economic community, imagining the circulation of currency as a circulation of blood through the vessels and the heart. For Hansen, similarly, in periods of growth, change is a swift stream. In periods of stagnation, by contrast, growth slows to a sedimentary accretion, and the stalled economy becomes a weakly anemic body. Stagnation is thus metaphorized as the, quote, unwholesome stillness of water or blood. One likely explanation for Hansen's use of these organic metaphors, especially those of the body, is his emphasis on population growth. Like the language of natural illiquidity, emphasis on demography recurs throughout the history of stagnation theory, reaching at least as far back as Smith, who believed that once a nation was fully peopled relative to its natural endowments, wage growth would slow to a crawl, and continuing most famously in Malthus, but remaining surprisingly persistent in 20th and even 21st century economics. 
For Hansen, the declining birth rates of the 1930s were, quote, overwhelmingly significant as a cause of economic depression. Mature economies, he argues, will experience chronic unemployment unless revitalized either by technological innovation or by population growth, and ideally by both. For Summers, too, declining US and European population growth means a declining natural rate of interest and declining demand for capital goods to equip new workers. Stagnation theory's particular use of demographic theory connects it to a long history of racialized, nationalist, gendered, and heteronormative anxieties about the birth rate. We find this in Malthus's fears about the status of family bonds among the overreproductive poor, and in Smith's Orientalist belief that the Chinese, which he uses as the sort of classic example of the stationary state for, for Smith as China, that the Chinese regularly, quote, drowned their children like puppies. Likewise, Keynes, authorized in part by Hansen's work, feared that the legalization of birth control advice and the decline of traditional patriarchal family arrangements um, would aid in economic stagnation, and as he helped create the post-war welfare state, came to support both gendered and racialized limits on the formerly radical promise of income redistribution. Mainstream contemporary scholars of stagnation like Summers, in turn, have connected the rise of joblessness to a more general, quote, flight from the family, which in turn is held accountable for the decline in the American birth rate, producing a heady ideological brew Melinda Cooper terms pronatalism, a moralizing, conservative, reproductive ideology which blames the contraceptive pill, declines in, quote, traditional families, and cultural feminism as causes for economic slowdown. Here, too, we can see the emphasis, the influence of Hansen, for whom the economy is not just a body economic, prone to an inevitable cycle of, quote, growth, maturity, and decline, and doomed to reach a point where it has, quote, spent its force, but more specifically, a reproductive body economic. Over and over, Hansen's empirical concern with demographics shows up in figurative language of barren bodies and stillborn children. Recall that stagnation is a, quote, sick recovery which dies in infancy. Against fantasies of endless autochthonous growth, we might note in particular a remarkably optimistic essay by Hansen's own mentor, Keynes, titled Economic Prospects for Our Grandchildren, which claimed in 1930, which is pretty crazy, that the power of so-called accumulation by compound interest had recently been, quote, reborn. Against this fantasy of endless growth, Hansen asserts, quote, a vigorous recovery is not just spontaneously born from the womb of the preceding depression. Melinda Cooper is right to connect Hansen's work to demographic economics pronatalism, but I want to suggest, too, that we might also read the language of stillborn reproduction against its grain, understanding it as a crystalline expression of what feminist political economist Silvia Federici has termed a, quote, permanent reproductive crisis. Capitalism can no longer guarantee the reproduction of the livelihood and ultimately the life of the worker herself, producing a crisis in the production of the commodity labor power. In the US, deinvestment in labor has taken the form of both wage stagnation and rising underemployment. Given the simultaneous rising price of basic necessities like health care, housing, and education, households turn to credit from mortgages and credit cards to student loans and even more dramatically exploitative forms of debt like payday loans. In the decades since the crisis, almost 95% of the new jobs added have been temporary part-time or contract work. Student and household debt continues to climb, and today's young people are the first downwardly mobile cohort in US history, the first generation who will likely have a lower standard of living than their parents. Put simply, reading reproductive anxiety this way turns us away both from the pronatalist notion of a moral crisis in the family, understood as a religious and moral form, and from the nationalist use of the family as metaphor for the ethnic state, and moves instead toward the more radical understanding of a material crisis in the household, understood as a purely economic category. Yet there is another side of demographic anxiety too, not just birth, but also death. Declining birth rates is but one marker of demographic decline. Rising mortality is another, 
In Hansen's epoch, the role of life expectancy in demographic change was not much of a concern. As a result of developments in preventative and curative medicine, improvements in standard of living, and a growing system of state welfare, life expectancy and standard of living steadily improved throughout the 20th century. Yet this is no longer true today. For the first time, US mortality rates are no longer improving. 2017 was the third straight year of declining life expectancy and a rising death rate, the first such three-year period of decline in, an, in a century. Contemporary theorists of economic stagnation are as worried about this as they are about falling birth, birth rates. Robert Gordon, for instance, notes that the improvement in life expectancy in the US has been slower than that of other countries and explains that the declines are worst within the lowest income quintile. As Gordon's analysis suggests, anxiety about life expectancy does not operate in quite the same register as pronatalism. It is more emphatically concerned with directly economic indicators like wage growth, labor force participation, and economic opportunity. Rather than evoking fantasies of familial reproductivity and figures of temporal futurity, it instead depends on a fetish of economic productivity and figures of spatial mobility. That is, mobility that is literally spatial, as in moving out of an economically depressed region, and mobility that is figuratively spatial, as in moving up from poverty. It also tends to address anxieties around collective entities like classes, races, or regions, rather than individual families. Yet mainstream discourse about rising mortality and morbidity has proved no less culturally conservative and politically revanchist than discourse about falling birth rates. Arguably, indeed, it may be even more so. As one example, consider the much-discussed research of economists Angus Deaton and Anne Case. In a series of well-publicized papers written for the centrist think tank, the Brookings Institute, Deaton and Case argue that whereas mortality rates have fallen among black and Hispanic Americans, they have risen for whites without a college degree. They also note rising morbidity rates, deteriorations in self-reported mental health, and rising reports of chronic pain among this group. Noting this disparity among trends in mortality and morbidity across racial groups, Deaton and Case suggest that the post-civil rights era reduction in the black-white wage gap, quote, gave an enduring sense of hope to African Americans, whereas for working class whites, a, quote, failure to meet early expectations has produced, quote, a Durkheim-like recipe for suicide. Not surprisingly, these findings made a splash in the wake of Trump's election producing headlines like, why the white middle class is dying faster, explained in six charts, or, quote, deaths of despair fuel Trump's victory. I'll just show you a couple of these, because the images of these are crazy. They're just like, I, I mean, I just kind of want to write about, like, the images. <laughs> um, so, like, we can notice, for instance, that the, that the figuration is always of men, and then also this image um, of the sort of dying flower. Um, to, as part of this sort of um, way that this is always connected to a kind of natural imaginary. Um, 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 okay, so producing headlines like these and buttressing think piece claims that the white working class had been left behind and that that's the explanation for Trump's victory. This has happened not only on the right, but also on the left. According to leftist opiners like Mark Lilla and Adolph Reed, for instance, the plight of the working class has been ignored because of an overweening attachment to what Lilla terms identity liberalism, or what Reed describes as leftist excessive commitment to so-called vertical inequality, inequality between groups, as opposed to horizontal inequality. Such claims appear to be confirmed by Deaton and Case's argument that although outcomes for non-whites are improving, supposedly because we've paid attention to the struggles of non-whites, outcomes for working class whites are deteriorating and no one seems to care. In fact, of course, Deaton and Case's data confirm something far less attention grabbing than the promotion of their work suggests. Black Americans still have significantly higher fatality rates than white Americans. That is, even though non-white mortality is improving, while white working class mortality is declining, these are trends, not absolute numbers. Um, similarly, that Deaton and Case argument about, um, about wage gains for, for African Americans in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement, there were wage gains, but there was still a wage gap, right? So you have the, a sort of a confusion between absolute numbers and trend lines. Um, 
I don't think it's a confusion. Um, I, think, I don't think it was an uh, intellectual confusion. I think it was an intentional misreading. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, these are trend lines, not absolute numbers. Black life expectancy is still four years below white life expectancy. Moreover, arguably the best case for thinking about a potentially urgent, although here misused, category like diseases of despair, that's Deaton and Case's term, forms of bodily suffering that are at once psychic and physiological, individual and collective, historical and uniquely contemporary, shows up in recent scholarship on black mortality and racism. Such scholarship has suggested that the differences between, the two, between white and black mortality are not fully explained by the indirect effects of racial segregation, but must be read as symptoms of racism itself in the significantly elevated stress levels experienced by those who encounter racial discrimination on a daily basis, or even that the health consequences of racial discrimination are transmitted transgenerationally through the body's biological memory of harmful experiences. So there's just really interesting work right now coming out about epigenetics and, and the effects of racism. Moreover, contrary to Deaton and Case and Lilla and Reed's fantasies of an either-or economy of attention, Crises of mortality and morbidity actually illuminate the intersections of race and class, especially as those relations determine the way bodies are valued and cared for relative to each other. The differential valuing of certain lives via racist and nationalist denigration is an effective means to drive down wages for all workers, producing a ready-made hierarchy of disposability for further disciplining labor. The capital flight, outsourcing, and hyper-exploitation that are often part of capital's desperate search for renewed profitability in a period of stagnation all depend on the ability to thusly render whole populations or regions surplus. Racialization is the most potent form taken by this logic of disposability. Thus, in conservative demographic discourse, even the white, so-called white rural poor are represented as an underclass, an underdeveloped colony, and a source of unproductive waste, especially those who live in the extractive zones where the opioid crisis has had particularly devastating effects on life expectancy. The, Ap the region of Appalachia has long been associated with stagnation of both the metaphorical and environmental sort and backwardness precisely because it lacked in the statistical measures of progress that mid 20th century America had generated to measure material and cultural advancement, education, literacy, technological development, and mostly life expectancy. National Review correspondent Kevin Williamson, for instance, has made a name for himself writing about the quote, bleak prospects facing the rural poor in places like Eastern Kentucky. Like Deaton and Case and Gordon and Summers, Williamson emphasizes regional disparity in mortality rates. Quote, the truth about these dysfunctional downscale communities is that they deserve to die. Economically, they are negative assets. Williamson's writing indicates the most vile and violent version of the analogy between land, the body, and cultural progress. In Williamson, as in Smith and Malthus, descriptions of land and landscape render economic stagnation natural and thus ahistorical and apolitical. Williamson describes Appalachian culture as, quote, a compound stagnation, a socioeconomic Sultan sea that becomes more toxic every year, imagining economic decline as stagnant, unhealthy water in a way that would have fit right in with Smith's bioeconomics. Contrary to Williamson's representation of Appalachian immobility as the cause rather than the symptom of economic stagnation, of course, the possibility that a surplus population of wageless life might effectively dispose of itself by dying young doesn't necessarily pose a problem for a capitalism eager to discipline labor by any means necessary. So in fact, I just found a headline the other day that was from, um, I can't remember if it was from, I think it was from The Economist, um, may have been from Forbes, that was about how a, a bunch of companies like GM, for instance, with massive pension plan obligations have um, recently experienced stock tick upgrades because they've realized that declining life expectancy um, re reduces, removes some of the burden of their pension obligations. And so if this poses both a long-term opportunity for them um, and also short-term in terms of their stock market value, it allowed them to tick up a bit. This was about three weeks ago that this was announced. So it's not always a problem when people die young for capital. Thus Marx, for instance, describes the, quote, stagnant surplus population of the unemployed, quote, characterized by a maximum of working time and a minimum of wages, 
If these surplus subjects die, it matters essentially not at all to capital. So-called diseases of despair likewise may be no more than a new way to de decrease by violent attrition the surplus population of the unemployable, a way of taking these negative assets off the balance sheet entirely. Moreover, increases in mortality, morbidity, and diseases of despair aren't solely the purview of the unemployed, but also of those earning the very low wages ever more common in an age of stagnant growth. Compared to other wealthy nations, concentration of low pay is highest in the US, while lifetime improvement in wages is lower. Contrary to Williamson's fantasy of geographic mobility as economic mobility, US adults are far more likely to cycle between low pay and no pay than into high wage and out of low wage work. Low wage workers are particularly vulnerable to deteriorating working conditions and suffer disproportionately from job related physical injuries and strain, as well as from indirect health impacts such as cardiovascular disease. Thus, another way to describe the insights of recent demographic data is this. Capitalism dragging through a long downturn is not only happy to let the unwaged die, it is also happy to work the low waged to an early death. Of course, in the 19th century, during an ascendant capitalism, there was indeed a risk involved in working too many of one's workers to death. Thus, Marx argues that when the industrial population is depleted by low wages and overwork, a still vital rural population, violently removed from formerly communal lands, comes to take its place. Capital depended on its periphery, whether newly enclosed farms or newly dispossessed colonial frontiers, to restore growth to its core. Today, the core produces its own surplus populations via automation and outsourcing, and the devastating results are often felt first in rural spaces. Meanwhile, in the periphery, population growth continues while labor demand dwindles. As those from the global south migrate north, they meet a US workforce threatened by wage stagnation, a failing social welfare state, and, at least among the non-college educated, the rural, young people, and people of color subjected to intensified forms of state violence by various forms of bodily, social, and economic despair. The result is what Phil, geographer Phil Neal calls a new serration of capitalism's geography and landscape. Neal's account attends neither to birth nor death, but rather to population movement, he describes a, quote, demographic inversion, where the poor move just behind capital, except always a little too late to catch up. Drawing on natural metaphors, fire and flood, blood and oil, sedimentation and geological stratification, Neal's account shares stagnation theory's bioeconomic imaginary, as well as its specific emphasis on images of illiquidity and immobility. The low economic output of the hinterland, he writes, causes, quote, a slowness that gets to you, sinking into your body and wrapping itself like molasses around your bones. If you take anything away from this talk, it's that you should read this book. It's a really good book. It's not a perfect book. It's very provocative, and some of it I fundamentally disagree with, but it's really sweet, generous, and amazing. Um, blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Plug there for that book. Um, he's a grad student also. <laughs> Um, it's amazing. Um, he, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, he also adopts stagnation theory's figurative attention to the effects of economic despair on the body. Recalling Hansen's images of stillness and stillbirth, we should note Neil's description of the economy as a non-reproductive landscape body. The deindustrial hinterlands, he writes, are, quote, like a vast sunken continent that met its ruin in some ancient cataclysm, populated now with broken-looking people sifting through the rubble of economies stillborn or long dead. For Melinda Cooper, persuasively, such images of economies stillborn reflect stagnation theory's preoccupation with birth rates and thus sustain a discourse of reproductive futurity. In this talk, I have attended instead to the other registers of the demographic, particularly those surrounding mortality and morbidity, as well as to the language of demographic immobility out of identities, regions, and landscapes deemed doomed to decline. I have suggested that demographic discourses like the diseases of despair thesis and its liberal equivalents tend to be propped up by a zero-sum theory of race and class as subjects of attention. Such accounts present race as a, quote, merely cultural category and class as the more properly economic concept. Yet their own definition of class is largely culturalist, dependent on ideas about the good old days of trade union politics, churches, families, moral fortitude, and so on, while their account of race fails to attend to racialization's economic substrate. <clears throat> 
Moreover, and again despite a pretense to the cool objectivity of an economic account attentive to supposedly non-political forces like demographic change, such stagnation theories tend to resurrect a long familiar racialized and regionalized discourse of economic slowdown as a consequence of cultural, social, or bodily decline. The barren bodies Cooper identifies in reproductive demographic discourse become the anemic, weak, and often raced bodies of mortality demographic discourse. In both instances, such bodies catacrestically appear both as cause and as figure. Yet I have also suggested that demographic data, if not demographic discourse, about mortality and morbidity may reveal something powerful about the relationship between the individual body, raced and gendered, exploited or surplus, and the collective experience of a population, raced and gendered, exploited or surplus. One name for the way this relationship is read through and on the body is immiseration. Immiseration in this context might mean both the immiserating tendency of capitalism as a structure and also something more immediate and intimate, a condition of livelihood and life itself. It might, in other words, provide the grounds for an economic determinism that would resist the highly conservative nature of the stagnation theorists with their desire to ascribe responsibility to a declining culture or a decaying social structure, but that also isn't exclusively an impersonal structuralism that might provide a theory committed both to the economic as last instance cause while also attuned to the urgency of embodied experience and individual consciousness. To get a little closer to that promise, I want to conclude with one final notion, one I will get at by returning to the essay from Hansen with which I began. We are passing, so to speak, over a divide which separates the great, growth of, great era of growth and expansion of the 19th century from an era which no man, unwilling to embark on pure conjecture, can as yet characterize with clarity or precision. We are moving swiftly out of the order in which those of our generation were brought up, indeed no one, into, no one, into no one knows what. Hansen here is trying to describe a change marked by the end of change the end of growth, development, and progress, as well as a change that is the familiar now passing into the uncertain new of the future. The language he uses to describe that shift from what is known to what is not yet is the language of the generation. That same language shows up in Gordon's book too, which, as he describes it, quote, ends by doubting that the standard of living of today's youths will double that of their parents, unlike the standard of living of each previous generation of Americans back to the late 19th century. It shows up in Neil as well, who notes the relationship between the uneven distribution of development, not only by geography, but also by generation, and who describes his millennial cohort as, quote, one of the poorest generations in research, recent history, debt and rent the defining features of our lives. And it shows up in one final instance of stagnation discourse whose contours I want to limb, the discourse of millennial burnout which evokes the stilled, the stalled, the stagnant by way of the language of paralysis. We're deeply in debt, working more hours and more jobs for less pay and less security, struggling to achieve the same standards of living as our parents, operating in psychological and physical precariousness, one widely circulated article on burnout explains. The category of the generation has been criticized widely, of course, derided as, quote, overly schematized and ridiculously reductive, as, quote, arbitrary and, quote, deterministic. The discourse of millennial burnout has been accused of the same thing, excoriated for its tendency to define a whole generation via the experiences of a small subset, typically white, middle, and upper middle class, college educated. And indeed, the language of burnout tends to assume a subject who had something to burn who once believed with a kind of cruel optimism that they had a high achieving successful future ahead of them and then had that future snatched away. And thus seems to disregard those for whom such promises were always bankrupt. In another essay on burnout, a respondent answering the question, what does burnout feel like for you? Answers, quote, as a black woman, I feel as if I were born tired. My mother was a social worker. My grandmother was a teacher. Her mother was a slave. I was born burned out. These critiques are certainly true. It's true that categories built on generations generalize and homogenize, though so do categories like class. And it's true that they do so in what might seem like arbitrary ways, though so do historical periods. 
Yet in a language of stagnation and generational hopelessness, I think, we might see the utility of the concept of the generation if carefully deployed. It suggests a subject historically determined, but also possessing a certain clear-eyed awareness of that determination, a subject in the midst of a history not of her choosing, but perhaps able to make and change that history nonetheless. And in Neil's description of a generational crisis in which his is, quote, not a single temporarily fucked generation, but instead the first in a grand parade of the futureless, we see yet another possibility for images of stalled reproduction and stilled mobility, not as the loss of the future promised by and to the past, but as the uncertain certainty that what comes next cannot be the future that always came before, but must instead be something altogether different. Thanks.